The subject this morning is the importance of the International Concord Movement for the Preservation of the Automobile. And uh, what I'm going to do is basically uh, briefly mention the, the new international effort, which Bob mentioned, and then go back through the history of the Concord, uh, where it started, and how it's evolved into the uh, kind of shows we have today. Uh, obviously, if we're talking preservation, that involves judging and evaluation, so we'll talk about the different uh, judging methods that are used. And then also get into a proper preservation and over restoration. So briefly, uh, the International Chief Judge Advisory Group is quite a new group. It was announced at Monterey Car Week in 2015. And uh, that took place uh, after I'd retired as a longtime Chief Judge at Pebble Beach. And uh, I said Pebble Beach, I think most of you know, is uh, world-class show, normally regarded by most as the number one concord in the world. And I felt when I had retired from Pebble Beach, after having been there for a long time, and implementing the uh, standard judging forms and guidelines that are used there today, that but that would be it. But as soon as I had retired from Pebble Beach, I began to get calls from other shows who said, well, now that you have more time, you can come and help us. Well, I've been at this uh, for 40 years. I wasn't interested in recycling back through uh, uh, chief judge assignments. I'd already done that for a good chunk of my life. But I recognized that there was interest out there in the part of other shows to improve their judging. And so that's the reason the International Chief Judge Advisory Group was uh, established. It's, uh, it's a worldwide organization. I can't do everything myself. I try to get out to as many of the shows as I can. But there are 10 uh, experienced uh, chief judges on that advisory group. Uh, literally all of them have judged for me through the years and then went on to become chief judges in their own right. They're from five different countries and so we're well scattered. And, uh, and I certainly need those people because uh, they're all very active and they're out there helping these uh, other shows. Uh, I'm quite surprised <clears throat> at the reception. I'm not sure what the interest would be. But a little more than one year later, uh, the ICJAG members are directly involved in helping 22 shows in eight countries improve their judging so that it's more focused on original and authenticity. So as Bob says, we just keep uh, moving forward with this very important subject. Well, the subject today is preservation, and that has really come to the fore, because in the past, it was basically correct restoration. You know, fix, replace what needs to be done. Well, unfortunately, what happened over the years, and I suppose it happens in many new areas of uh, collectability, when they first get launched, there, there have been far too many ground up restorations of cars that it shouldn't have been done. Because these are important cars and motorcycles also. We cover both cars and motorcycles. Simply because they had signs of age, age use and patina, people felt they had to restore them repaint them, spruce them up? No. Preservation is very important because things are only original once. Only once. And once you touch them, whether it's to replace, repair, or refinish, it's no longer original. If it's done in the original manner, it's authentic. But it's not originally original as uh, issued by the factory. If you look at the older areas of collectability, and we're talking things like antique furniture, uh, ancient ceramics, all the rest of it, I think uh, you've probably seen shows on television like uh, Antique Roadshow. Uh, I'm sure you've read about what happens if you take a nice piece of antique furniture. I will use that as an example. It has signs of age, use, and patina, but you don't touch it because what's there is original. And as long as it's not broken, as long as it has the original appearance, you don't try and refinish it or clean it up because if you do it, torpedoes the value. Why? Because you've destroyed some of the originality. Well, hobbies like the antique furniture collecting hobby have been around for a very long time. Some of those areas have been around for a couple <coughs> hundred years. Um, the automobile hobby 
the automobile hasn't been around a whole lot longer than a hundred plus years. And the concourse scene that you see today where we judge these cars for uh, their originality, authenticity, and condition is fairly new. It's basically post-war, so it's relatively new as these other areas go. And I think uh, it's none too soon that we've uh, taken a look around at these other areas that I've mentioned and said, hey, we've got to talk more preservation and less restoration. Now, as to where the Concorde d'Elegance came from, and that basically uh, stands for Contest of Elegance. Well, you can go all the way back to, you know, uh, humans are competitive people, and so in any of these uh, affinity groups, regardless of what they are, we're talking automobiles here, you're going to find that people like to get together and compare what they have and look for the best. And so you can go all the way back to the Roman chariots where you had all these beautiful custom-made chariots for some of the wealthy members of Roman society. And of course, they like to bring them out and compare. Then another one I like to use is horse-drawn carriages. You know, at one time there were many, many shows where people brought their beautiful uh, horse-drawn carriages to a central location and they dressed in costume and they, uh, they competed uh, for awards. Then along comes the automobile in the later part of the 1800s and uh, all of a sudden we're moving from horse-drawn carriages to uh, the early automobiles. Now the Concorde d'Elegance scene, and that's a French term because the early Concorde d'Elegance for automobiles started in France in the early 1900s. Well, today when we have shows, we have cars that are 100 years old that'll be in an antique class that we're judging. In the early 1900s, when the automobile was fairly new, you would have the Concours, the Contest of Elegance, but it was all new cars. So there wasn't much to judge from the standpoint of originality. So that's how elegance becomes uh, a part of the definition, that they weren't comparing these early automobiles to see you know, which were original or which had been authentically uh, repaired, restored. They were basically new automobiles that uh, people brought out to uh, show to the world. And it was the habit for the uh, family to get dressed in period costume. You see the old pictures, you even see the dogs as part of the picture. And it was truly a contest of elegance. The present day Concours, now we move it forward, it's basically a, a post-war activity in the main part. And so now you've had automobiles that have been around for decades. Well, when the Concours uh, started post-World War, things came to a halt during World War II, as you might imagine, even the production of cars came to a halt. Everything went to the war effort. And so after the war, when uh, some of the early Concours, uh, here in America, for example, Pebble Beach is one of our oldest Concours, you might be interested to know that the Hillsborough Concours, which is held right here in the Bay Area, is the oldest continuous Concours in the world. And they use that as a hook. Uh, Pebble Beach has been around longer, but there was a year when Pebble Beach didn't have the show. 1960. 60. So there's a break. So Hillsborough can proudly declare Wet that there never been. <laughs> well, in those early Concours for the cars and motorcycles, there were no standard forms, guidelines. It was basically, let's have a show. Who, who wants to volunteer to handle the judging? Okay, I'll handle, who wants to volunteer to be a judge? I mean, it, it was really that, uh, really that loose, if you will, because there were no standards. And then because, uh, <laughs> There wasn't a whole lot of preparation in those days put into selecting judges, training judges, developing them so they would have the knowledge to know what they're looking at from an originality standpoint. The fallback was cosmetics. You know, who, who's got the uh, cleanest car, the shiniest paint job, the, the car that knocks you out? Well, that's all important and it still comes into play today when you select a a group of class winners. You wash out the scores because they've all been judged by different teams and so now you have 20, 25 cars that are all class winners. 
They've all been judged, authenticated as the real deal. And so elegance still comes into play today when you go to select best of show. You know, which one of these authenticated class winners would you like to have represent the show this year? And so uh, elegance still very much comes into play. It also comes into play in what we call special and major awards, which are again, we might talk a little more about, the, they're subjective awards. But what we like to see is class judging for originality and authenticity. And as I said, the major awards, special awards are more subjective. I have to say that, well, I'm obviously a proponent of class judging for originality and authenticity because it helps properly preserve the cars, helps ensure they've been correctly restored. I like to get the shows that uh, we're involved with, we like to provide feedback to the owners. And I always tell the judges, you know, judge seriously, pay attention to what you're doing because any entrant that's being judged today who would like to get feedback, you'll share it with them and you'll tell them what deductions we've taken and how they might correct. Now, not all, a lot of shows don't do that. They don't do that because we're still working on getting shows to pay more attention to originality and authenticity. I mentioned we're well represented. We have 22 shows that are using the standard ICJAG. Incidentally, this term ICJAG, for short, we call it ICJAG. I wanted to pick something that would roll off the, uh, the tongue, and I hear that term ICJAG, so I guess it's easy for people to remember. But there are hundreds of shows out there across the world. And a lot of them are still quite subjective because if you're going to have a serious show judging for originality and authenticity, whoever is chief judge for that show is going to have to spend a lot of advanced time selecting who they want to be judged, making sure that they're assigned to cars where they know what they're looking at, uh, get them used to using the, the standard international forms and guidelines, which are the ICJAG forms. And uh, it takes a fair amount of effort, as I'm sure my friend and fellow Judge Bob would agree. And so often, particularly at the local and regional level, you know, get down to the local charity shows, that's where we all start, in, including both of us started at the local level. Because uh, they're always looking for volunteers. And so that's basically where you start with these shows. But because you're going into shows, and you're a judge that doesn't have much experience and maybe not much knowledge, and your fellow judges are going to be the same way, that's where you're going to find a lot of subjectivity. Shows like Hillsborough, for example, nice show, very long show, but a local show. And so uh, you're not going to get judged near as rigorously there as you would at Pebble Beach. Pebble Beach is just the opposite. In the eyes of most, that's the top uh, concord in the world. And when I was chief judge at Pebble Beach, I had no problem getting volunteers because if you're in judging, it's like anything else. If you're in judging at the local, regional, club level, you'd like to judge at Pebble Beach someday. So you say, okay, I, I made it, judge at Pebble Beach. So I always had a long waiting list at Pebble Beach and some people had to wait quite a while because I found that once you select people for, uh, to judge there, of course, you've got to pry them out with a pitchfork. And, uh, and they like to stay, and I would normally keep them as long as they were doing the job that was expected. And of course, a lot of them are very, very good and do stay there a long time. I was involved in judging there myself uh, for 30 years. I figured 30 years of judging at Pebble Beach is enough for anybody, particularly the serious class judging. Now, the honorary judging is different. I've always already referenced that that's somewhat subjective. So. Per our international judging process, we make a real distinction between class judging, serious, originality and authenticity, honorary judging, subjective, to uh, honor special cars, rare cars that perhaps didn't do quite so well in class judging, but uh, they're a, a prominent collector with a very large collection. The Art Academy, for example, you, there's a very large collection here. Well, the show is like cars to come from this collection to be put out at the shows uh, for display. And they've done that often, they've won lots of awards, and so 
if the Academy of Art brings a very nice and rare car out to enhance a show, they'd probably be recognized with some sort of special or honorary award. Best to show is the one that's different because I already mentioned that the only cars that are eligible for best to show are cars that won the class. Because whoever the best of car show is going to be, we want it to be either an original or authentically restored car. I'm sure you know there's lots of modified cars out there. Hot rods, I love hot rods and custom cars. I, I go back to the 50s where I had a hot rod in the 50s. So, and I still have hot rods, as well as some other cars. Uh, those are uh, special categories, <coughs> but you're not going to judge cars like that for originality and authenticity because they're original cars that have been taken and modified for personal use. And, uh, and then, of course, you have concept cars, you have limited production manufacturers that like to show that they're, they're all wonderful cars but they're in a different category and they're judged more subjectively. So you will find cars like that, you know, falling often into the major awards or special awards category. To thank you for bringing that wonderful car. We'd like you to come back. We want to recognize that wonderful hot rod or that wonderful modified car. Here's your award. Although there are shows that set up classes for these uh, kind of cars I've just mentioned. A hot, hot rod, a lot of shows have hot rod classes, for example, we're pleased to see that. Obviously, they need to be judged differently. If you have judges judging a hot rod class, clearly they start off as on original cars that have been modified and built to personal taste. So what do we judge in a hot rod class? We judge craftsmanship and creativity and the, and the presence of the car. So that, that's a little different. Let's talk about uh, proper preservation when a vehicle should be disturbed. This is a rather important subject and one we wrestled with to properly define when not too long ago we got into heavy discussion. We got to push preservation more. There are too many of these cars that are being restored that shouldn't be restored. So what are we going to find as a preservation car? And there's been a lot of discussion that not only at the local shows, at Pebble Beach. Bob mentioned that I'm a senior advisor to the International FIBA organizations, which sets the worldwide standards for uh, proper preservation, correct restoration, and also a senior advisor for the Historic Vehicle Association. That's this pin right here, which is the North American branch of FIBA. <coughs> And there was a lot of discussion, as you might imagine, because you have what are generally called barn finds, right? Uh, they're obviously uh, original cars, but if they're a barn find, they're usually so far gone that you can't bring them back. They've been sitting in an open, leaky shed full of rodents, you know, for decades. And somebody finds them after 50 years and pulls them out. Wow! Where, you know, where did you find that? Where did that come from? And at first, people are inclined to say, well, that's a, that's a well-preserved car. That's a preservation car. I said, wait a minute. No, barn finds are not preservation cars. Because to be a proper preservation car, it has to have the appearance that it did when it was originally manufactured. It has to operate the way it did when it was originally manufactured. Run, right? There are many, many barn finds that are neat to look at, but they're beyond redemption. You know, you don't want to throw them away because it's a neat piece of history, but clearly not a preservation car because if the, in most cases they're not going to run, in almost all cases that they've been sitting there for years are not going to run. They've rusted away, they've got rodent damage, and you just can't leave it. It's going to have to be part of it repaired or replaced, in other words, hopefully correctly restored. Well, once it's been restored, it's no long, it can no longer be a preservation car. So that, that's the difference. The other thing that we require internationally, and I like to say FIBA sets the worldwide standards, in order for a vehicle to be a preservation car, you got to pick a date point. It goes back to the early Concorde where it wasn't too meaningful, you were comparing new cars. 
So when we go to judge and authenticate a preservation car as being a preservation car, it has to be 30 years old, it has to be intact, it has to have you know, the original appearance, it can show signs of extensive use, age and patina, but it's all got to be there, and it has to run. And we require, once we define a car as a preservation car, we say you not only need to keep it just the way it is now, but you need to drive it. You know, not necessarily on a regular basis, but exercise that car enough because in order to be a preservation car, it still has to operate as it was originally manufactured. And so uh, I'm fairly well known as Bob knows, and I started way back to remind people that a very important part of the originality and authenticity of an automobile or motorcycle is that it run. And so I got very used to saying, uh, when, I, when I was doing things for the Ferrari world, which is where all this started, Ferraris are meant to be driven. When I became chief judge at Pebble Beach and implemented our standard forms and guidelines across all the marks, then it became cars are meant to be driven, motorcycles are meant to be ridden. Now, you people obviously have an interest in motor vehicles, and they need to be exercised just like we need to be exercised, right? If you have a neat car, and it's so nice that you're afraid to drive it, and unfortunately too many people with Ferraris are afraid to drive their cars, well, they'll look nice sitting there, but if you wait too long, they're going to get back at you, right? They're not going to run. You're going to get flat spots in the bearings and the tires, the, the uh, seals are going to start to uh, dry out and leak and, uh, you know, it's just uh, with this lousy gas we have available today, things are going to start corroding. So no, uh, you, you have to get out and drive the cars. I will also say in mentioning that, that there are shows, and we're talking about more of the subjective shows, you know, the local and regional shows, where they don't have the cars and motorcycles start. Well, all of these shows are independent and they're free to do as they wish. But again, uh, the operation of the automobile is an important part of the package. And I like to see shows asked for vehicles to be started. Uh, in the antique class at Pebble Beach, we have cars over 100 years old. They're expected to start and run. You know, the lights and other things are expected to work. And if they don't, they get heavily penalized and they're not going to make it to an award category. I must tell you, when I started getting involved with the motorcycles, and I'm a lifelong motorcyclist. Uh, you may not believe it, but I've been riding motorcycles since 1948. Long time. Still have four of them. I must say, if I tried to ride the way I used to, however, I'd kill myself. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do too much high-speed lane splitting anymore. <laughs> Be thankful if you live through that, but you know, love, love motorcycles. Just, just be careful. I must tell you, the Bay Area's gotten a lot more crowded, as you probably know. I think you shook your head, you ride bikes. It's, uh, you gotta be more defensive, but uh, love bikes. Probably the reason all of my cars are open, short wheelbase roadsters because I like being out there, as we say in the motorcycle world, in the wind, right? Worst thing to ever happen was the helmets, but that's another subject. <laughs> <laughs> we'll cover that another time. Uh, mainly because it takes the sensation away, right? You, you're, you're in a cage, your head's in a cage. Well, that's another deal. We'll, I'll come back and talk motorcycles someday if you want me to. Okay. Um, so incorrect pres proper preservation. We talked about barn finds, separate category. You can leave them the way they are, rusted out pieces of junk in some cases, but they're a piece of history. Don't put a lot of time and money into those because you're never gonna get to the preservation status. There's too much that's needed to get back in the road. Incorrect preservation that comes into play when, if you have to do any work, and we're not saying that a preservation car has to be 100% untouched or unrestored, because these are cars. We want them to be used. They're out in traffic. 
been out in traffic through the decades, chances are excellent that they're going to have a fender bender or they had an accident along the way. Well, you don't leave it that way. Uh, you can say, well, I'm not going to fix that damage. This is an original car. Well, <coughs> that's not original. It come out of the factory with dents in it. So uh, in most cases, it's going to be hard to find a preservation car that's never been touched. When, when we do find one, it's like the holy grail. And there are a handful of them out there. And they're usually a car that was purchased new, a special car for the family. And it was maybe purchased 70 years ago. The original family still has the car. They had somebody who was a car person interested enough to maintain that car and take care of the preventive maintenance. And boy, you see a car like that. I mean, it's really pretty special. So most of them are going to have some work done on them. We want as little as possible. We like to say that when we judge a preservation car, and if you've done enough judging, you can pretty much tell where it's been spotted, repainted, anything done to it. Uh, we don't like to see cars have any more than a 10% repaint. If they do, they can still make it the preservation standard, but at the 10% more point, we begin to deduct. And by the time you get to a total repaint, the car may be all original. Something happened to it. Maybe it was in a storm. Maybe it was in a hailstorm. Had to be repainted. Well, unfortunately, that's a total repaint. None of the original paint left. So that's going to be a five-point deduction. And that will uh, weigh heavy in becoming a class winner, for example. The thing that we really are against, and it's a tough one to administer, is artificial patina. In these days of high tech, the major restoration shops has gotten very, very good at developing artificial patina. You know, proper aging, proper look, proper paint analysis, the whole thing. I mean, you can do almost too much with high tech, which also applies to factory documentation. And so what I try to get across to the restoration shops, I remember when it came up for the first time, it came up in regards to a car at Pebble Beach. It's been several years ago now, and we started really homing in on preservation. And I remember that a very nice car came onto the field, and the restoration shop, because I'd said, don't artificially patinize things. The car showed up with an engine component with new old stock, had never been used out of the box. So actually, when you put that in there, it's going to look different than the other things that have been under the hood for years out getting weathered. And they were given a deduction for that. Well, I quickly made it known we're not going to deduct for things like that because these, uh, these objects will uh, age on their own age naturally soon enough. They'll develop their own patina. And it won't be too many years before it folds in with the rest of it. Yes, you can apply, you can cleverly apply artificial patina. And you pop open the hood. We're talking about the engine compartment. And everything looks consistent. And unless you look real close or ask questions, it looks like it's all been there for decades. It hasn't. Some of it's been artificially patinated. Well, you get into apples and oranges. And, and, owners, and owners will say, well, God, that doesn't look right. It looks too shiny. You know, age it, age it. No, we want to work hard. I work very hard on that these days. Do not artificially age things. If you do and we find out about it, you're going to get a rather heavy deduction, and that car is not going to become a class winner. But, but it, it's a tough one because things are getting uh, very good as far as uh, duplication. I'll just, I mentioned documentation. We depend, Bob mentioned I'm still on the selection committee at Pebble Beach. We depend and request that when people submit a car for Pebble Beach that they furnish a lot of documentation along with it. We like to see period photos because if somebody is entering a 1920 car and they send photos of that car taken 10 years ago and they say, well, yeah, it was that way originally, here's a picture. So when was it taken? It was taken in 1990 and I got it out of a book. Well, don't believe everything you read or see in books. 
No, what we like to get is a period photograph from the 20s, you know, when the car was fresh. The problem is, again, high tech, we love high tech, it has its good and bad points, but one of the things that can cause a problem is that if a person doesn't have that old factory <coughs> documentation, doesn't have old period photos, you can take and make currently produced documentation and recently taken photos look like they were taken decades ago. And they go pretty far. It's one of the disadvantages, I suppose, of the rare and special cars becoming so valuable. You know, the top of the pyramid, multi-million dollar cars. Well, if you come up with one of those cars and uh, you're restoring it, and a lot of those cars are special, a lot of them are one-off specialities, a lot of them are Ferraris, the Ferrari 250 GTO is the one that's risen to the very top. Can you imagine paying $40 million for a single automobile? I don't need to let to think of that. But, uh, but there were very few of them. There were world beaters. They won the World Manufacturers Championship three years in a row until they were beat by who? Cobra. Cobra. Carroll Shelby and his hot rodders beat them. Uh, that's a fabulous story, the Cobra Ferrari Wars. But in order to uh, document a car like that and bring it into a serious concours and be selected for a serious concours, like being put on the lot at Pebble Beach, we look at the documentation photos. Well, I must tell you that uh, we have found a number of cases where the documentation and the photos have been altered to make them look like they came from the right point in time, the right period. You, know, you age the paper and the whole thing. I'm sure you young people know a lot more about the high-tech world than I do, but you can do a lot of things with Photoshop and those sorts of tools. So we have to watch out very carefully for that. Um, that's preservation. Uh, correct restoration. Now, as I mentioned, there are cases where you have to do work. Yeah, that old barn find sits there and it's been there for 50, 60, 70 years, but it's so far gone, no chance of it being branded a preservation car. And people like to have a preservation car because like that piece of antique furniture, and you can see it, you can see it in the auction results just in very recent years. There begins to be a real spread between cars that have been restored and cars that have been preserved without restoration. And not too long ago, the values were pretty much like this. Well, now that a non-restored preservation car, and it's, the spread is going to be wider and wider, just like it is with these other things, like antique furniture and Chinese ceramics and the rest. So, okay, so you've got to go in and restore it because it's supposed to look and function the way it did when it was originally manufactured. We want it to uh, run properly. So we're going to restore it. Well, because the car concourse scene started off with not very many standards or guidelines, policies on how things were going to be judged or should be judged, people simply said that car needs to be restored without a whole lot of guidance. And so, yeah, the, the shops would go in and they'd pull out the old magazine doing a sports car, find some road and track where they had a car like that. And, there are various sources of information and libraries on the right, and okay, so they might have gotten a pretty good idea of what needs to be replaced and repaired authentically, so it does have the appearance of the original. But what we found happening is a great deal of over-restoration. And it was a lot of it in the painting area. And again, it goes back to the subjectively judge shows where they're judging for cosmetics and they're looking for the car that'll, you know, knock your socks off. Well, to make a spectacular presentation, color can have a big impact. And so all of a sudden, we're seeing pre-war cars that have fabulous paint jobs, but they're not period paint jobs. Uh, some of them, I used to use the term Bob probably heard me use it as I began to beat the drums on this, it began to almost look like circus wagons. Now, there were shows, uh, there were the, the great auto shows where they show the new models, they still have that, the Triad Auto Show, Geneva, Paris, et cetera. 
where a manufacturer will take a car out of the lineup and they, do, they will do special things to it. They'll put a spectacular paint job. They'll put more chrome plating on it than it should have. Well, we research those cars and a car like that, of course, that was prepared for a major slow stand won't get deductions. But you try that stuff on the regular production models, you're gonna get deducted. So first of all, today, if a car is being seriously class judged for originality and authenticity, we don't say you have to have the exact original paint because sometimes the records are not that complete. Many times, particularly in the old days, an owner would deal directly with a factory and request a special color. Today we want period colors. Plating, there's a fair amount of chrome plating as chrome is chrome, but there's a fair number of alloy parts on many of these cars, particularly in the engine compartment. If you polish those alloy parts, it's not too long before they look like chrome. And it may be spectacular when you pop open the hood, it looks like a jewelry shop in there, not original. Over restored, we're gonna deduct for that. Uh, finishes, of course, there you get into a chassis black. And most of that is semi-gloss or flat. If you use gloss, it may look, may look great, but it's not original. We're going to deduct for glossy finish if it was only meant to be flat or semi. Seams. There are manufacturers that had very good coach work, paid a lot of attention to the fit of the panel and the seams. There are others that weren't so careful. I'll use Ferrari as a notable example. Ferrari, basically a small manufacturer, always struggling to get money because they're throwing everything they brought in the door into racing. And of course, they're still uh, big on the racing scene. But when they built, uh, went to build their race cars, particularly those where the coach work was done by Scaletti, no, they didn't have a whole lot of money. Scaletti was just down the road, a, a friend of Enzo Ferrari's. We gotta go racing next month. Get that car finished. Get it together, we gotta go. And so on a lot of the Scaletti race cars, you will see poor fitting seams, seams with an uneven gap. That's the way where they were built. Another thing you'll see on those cars is the welds on the non-stressed members, on, on the uh, important stressed members of the chassis. Of course, they put their accomplished welders there, in the case of strength. But if they were building a uh, a wire structure to hold the body panels or something, well, not, not so much stress, and so they put the younger welders, the apprentices on those, and you'll see some very rough welds. Well, a few years ago, over restoration, they, they'd do a body off restoration, they'd see those rough, crappy looking welds, they'd smooth them all out and fill them in. No, 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 that's not the way it was done originally. When you do things like that, it may look better, but you're destroying some of the soul in character of the car, so we deduct for things like that. And I already talked to Applied Bettina. If we detect Applied Bettina, it's gonna be a deduction. Okay, that all goes by way. That whole uh, preface there had to do with the need to develop standard forms and standard judging guidelines. And uh, I guess I was instrumental in that because I'm the old guy, been at it so long, then in the days when I started, there were no standards and guidelines, not even in the big club shows. And so I got involved at the local level with the Ferrari Club of America back in the 70s, had a couple of my own cars judged, didn't feel the people knew what they were looking at from the standpoint of originality, it's who's got the best paint, who's got the cleanest today meaningless. So I developed some forms for the local Ferrari group. Uh, they were soon picked up nationally and we had a big international meet in 1984 that a lot of people attended as an international Ferrari meet where these forms were introduced nationally for the first time and there were a lot of people from other countries. So anyway, long story short, we went from using that initial material locally here in the Bay Area to the point where it was picked up by the National Ferrari Club of America group. Uh, I became their first chief judge and was their chief judge for over 20 years. I mentioned IEC PFA here. 
that's a mouthful, which is why I made e icy jag easier to say. That stands for the International Advisory Council for Preservation of the Ferrari Automobile. The reason I set up that group is 40 years ago, people didn't know who I was. You know, I was just a guy, local guy, trying to make judging better. So when the Ferrari Club of America got interest, I formed this international advisory group because I was not the well-known one then. It was the people that were writing the Ferrari books, the people that were running the national board for the club of the Ferrari Club of America. And so I said, I'm going to need support because nobody knows who I am. They've never seen this stuff. So I contacted a number of those people and I formed an uh, advisory council. The whole purpose was that here's a group of people I can get together with and talk, just like I'm talking to you, introduce them to the forums and guide, get their support, and then they go forth and talk about it. Uh, there's board members here, right? And so those board members will take the message back to their fellow board members at the national level. And that group is still in existence. It was founded in 1984. Uh, I retired as the chairman some years ago. But it goes on, and that's become an important forum. It has 20 people on it. It has the best Ferrari restorers, historians, researchers. Um, it also has representation for our, from uh, Ferrari Classic K, the factory certification group. Because we're all working together here. So I'm pleased that that's still functioning for the Ferrari world. When the Ferrari Club of America picked up the, uh, the process we're talking about here, in the early 90s, the Palm Beach Cavalino Classic was established. That's considered the number one Ferrari Concours in the world. Uh, they invited me to be their first chief judge, so I helped found the Cavalino Classic. And uh, again, I've been around long enough. I'm, ret I'm the uh, retired chief judge there also. But like Pebble Beach, they're kind enough to invite me back as an honor each year so I can get the rest, watch the rest of them do the hard work, right? Mm -hmm. I say, but be advised while I'm over there with the champagne lady with the other honoraries, if I see anything untoward, I'll say, now hear this, do it right. <laughs> but they're a great group. We have a wonderful group of judges. I've, I've been at a long time. I've got. 500 judge resumes in my international files. I, so I often get calls, you know, we need a couple of good judges. Can you give us a recommendation? Well, I can give them lots of good recommendations. So that's come a long ways. And I mentioned when we started the first item, the International Chief Judge Advisory Group, I, I think I indicated to you that that group was formed after I retired as Chief Judge of Pebble Beach, that where do we go now? Well, it, it's certainly exceeded my expectations. You know, I thought, well, I've done the last of my many retirements. You know, I retire, I'm going to retire as Chief Judge of Pebble Beach now, and then things will be, well, as you can see, I'm busier than ever. Um, so we have the IC JAG. Basically, I'd already mentioned we're currently 22 Concord in eight countries. Basically, our mission is to establish a select number of shows in a number of key countries that will carry the IC JAG label if they're doing things right. And so that entrants who want to be seriously judged for originality and authenticity who want to contribute to the preservation of these wonderful cars and motorcycles can come to one of these shows. If it's icy jag judging, they're going to know they're going to be seriously judged by some knowledgeable judges. Same as the Ferrari world. The Ferrari world still uses this label. If you look at the entry form for the Cavalino Classic or the National Meet, you'll see ICPFA judging. It says, this is serious judging. This is not one of our chapters or regions having a fun concord to see who's got the best car of the day. This is serious stuff. So that's for the, the Ferrari mark. Now, Icy Jag is for all of the marks from all periods. Ferrari single post-war mark. This both pre-war, post-war covers all marks. So it's, it's a big step up. 
and it's a fair amount of work, but I, I'm just uh, overjoyed at the reception that's received because some of the shows that have adopted our ICJAG judging process have been around for 20 years, and they've been used to doing it their way. And not only that, but I've told these shows that when I can provide you a turnkey package of judging forms and judging guidelines, but if you don't have a good experience and knowledgeable chief judge, if you don't have some good experience and knowledgeable senior chief class judges, it's not going to work too well. You know, you'll, you'll be looking at the same things on each car or motorcycle. You'll be looking at them in the same sequence. You'll be looking at them equal time for everybody. But if you don't have the knowledge of the judges along with it, well, it's a nice checklist, but you've got to have judges who know what they're looking at. And so in a number of these cases, these shows, uh, to my uh, delight, actually replaced their chief judge. I said, number of you, you good guy, he's been there for years and pretty well settled in, but he's not gonna be able to do it. You're gonna need a new chief judge. Here's three names, pick one. And so uh, they've done that, so I'm just delighted with the support we're getting. Uh, future Concord activity, <clears throat> we've got a fully developed judging process. We've got judging guidelines, forms, we've got policy statements on what constitute conflict of interest. Proper field manner, very important. You may be the most knowledgeable guy out there on certain models of a, of a car, but if you can't interact well with people, if you can't get along well with the entrance, well, you, you have poor field manner. No, you've got to have good field manner to go with it. We're all working together here, and we want everybody to feel good that we're all trying to uh, do things for the future here. I was just contacted by a fellow who happens to be in the Bay Area here from the high-tech world. He is in the process of developing an accreditation process for team judges. Now, there are certification processes to indicate that a judge, a brand new judge, has some experience. If you're in the Classic Car Club of America, big group, they have, the, they have a judge certification and training program for team judges. Uh, there are other mark clubs that do that, but there's a lot of the car world and these judges come from all over and for many of them, there's not a good way to select them or accredit them or certify them or whatever you want to call it. So this fellow, his name is Paul Mitchell, he's judged at some of the local shows and a couple of the regional shows and he said, we need something to get better judges. You know, I study this stuff. I think I know what I'm doing, but I get assigned to people that don't know what they're doing. We need a certification process. So he came and he said, you know, you got icy jag. What can we do for you? Um, in fact, we're having another dinner with him in a couple of days. So he's developing a uh, formal certification product process to identify new judges, identify existing judges who have potential to go on to be senior chief class judges or chief judges, the people that lead the charge. So that fits right in with what we're trying to do. On ICJAG itself, I've mentioned chief class judge, chief judge, these are the people that I expect to be out there leading the charge, you know, the, the positions that I held when I was on the field. And so we're very interested in picking the proper people to fill these slots, and they've got to be good. Like I just mentioned, I've gone to some of these shows, yeah, we want to go icy jag. Well, you can do that, but you're going to get, have to get a new chief judge. So I say, oh, really, who do you recommend? So when we, we're careful. When we recommend somebody for these slots, you want to know those people. You want to have experience with them. Literally all of them had judged for me along the way, and I know who can do the job and who can't. If you just throw out a name, you know, based on friendship or something else, no, that doesn't work. You take our friendship hats off and our business hats off. Uh, in a lot of cases, I started using people who were in the business many years ago. When I first became chief judge at Pebble Beach, they didn't use people that were in the business. I said, why aren't you using people in the business? They're the people who work on this stuff all day. 
They, they know the cars better than it. Well, because they're in the business of conflict of interest. I said, this is the way we're gonna do it. You folks want us to judge for originality and authenticity. I've got to have the knowledge. A lot of the knowledge is housed with the people who are in the business. My job as chief judge is to keep them away from any cars they've had any involvement in. Put them in a class where they don't have a conflict. And I've done that, and I would say that at least half of the people at Pebble these days are in the business, have never had a problem. Because I was always very careful, and I assume my successor is also, of looking at things ahead of time, knowing what these judges are involved in, and keeping it away from cars where there's conflict. I also heavily endorse that judges be given a list of the cars they're going to judge, along with entrant documentation and so forth, at least a month before the show so they can do their homework. So do your homework, and by the way, when you're looking at those cars, if you've got anything that you've been involved in is defined by the conflict of interest statement, you let me know now, and I can reassign you. So it hasn't been a problem. I spent a minute on that because people still say, well, it's a conflict to use people in the, no, it's not. Not as long as you keep them away from cars they've been involved with. Now what we wanna do is with these 22 shows, not all of them are endorsed. Some of them have just gone to the international standards or in the process of implementing them. I will either be out there as I can, or one of the other nine chief judges in our ICJAG's core group will be out there. And we're gonna look at how that show uses the forums. We're gonna look at how the chief judge and the senior chief class judges handle things, the knowledge level, and then, if they check all the boxes, they're gonna be a show that gets the ICJAG endorsement. And I've already covered that I wanna brand that. So when people see that, they know what kind of judging. Now, of what great benefit is this besides the present day? The benefit to future generations. I've always said in all my judges, me, Bob knows, we're all gonna be gone, every one of us. The cars are still gonna be here, let's leave them right. So by concentrating on proper preservation and correct restoration, we judge based on originality and authenticity and we help ensure as a result of that a more accurate automotive history for those to follow. And of course, along with that, we want to be grooming some judges to replace us gray hairs when the time comes. So all this is really not just for today, it's for the future. 